All right. So let me uh, uh, back, come and talk to um, um, Latin America. Let me uh, make a comment. I was sitting in the back uh, earlier in the day, and I make a comment on a few things. So one thing, uh, talk, uh, a lot of people talking about whether China will serve as Uncle China and Uncle Sam, Uncle Sa China versus Uncle Sam thing. I think uh, China has no interest to serve as anybody's uncle. And, uh, but there is also in uh, throughout the history, if you look at this, China has been emperor for many, many years. And China, if you look at the literary, if you look at the, the Chinese character of China, literally means the center of center country. It's the center of the universe. So if you look at the history in China, emperor sits in the center. Um, all the peripheral will come in, they pay respect, pay tribute and the emperor will throw out all the goodies to the, the peripheral uh, countries. And I think uh, it's uh, China's interest to, to be restored to the old glories, to the old the, 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 the proper positions, but not necessarily as uh, serving as an uncle to, uh, to, uh, be, uh, to, uh, uh, to compete with the United States. Um, in a sense, but that, there's also there's one in, interesting um, uh, uh, words that describe China's uh, strategy very well. Uh, this, the grand strategy of China is called a Tao Guang Yang Hui. Uh, Tao Guang Yang Hui literally means that you hide your glow and grow your energy. So you, you hide your glow, you, you low, uh, keep a low profile and uh, don't uh, show your um, things and but grow your capacity. And if, if you look at this uh, uh, the historical meaning of this is coming out of, of two or three, two, more than 2,000 years ago, the conflict of two countries, two kingdoms in China. One kingdom was destroyed, was defeated by another kingdom. So the, the, the king of the defeated kingdom voluntarily served as a servant to the winner kingdom and served as, served as a servant in the court for several years. And that's where the word's coming from. That's that hide your glow, your, your glory of a, of a king, but you grow your capacity, and eventually the defeated king returned to his kingdom and, uh, and eventually defeated uh, the, the previous winner. Uh, so that's this story coming from. I'm not, not necessarily saying that China or necessarily is, is in, a, in a, a direct conflict with the United States, but there is a sense that China wants to restore its uh, the proper position, like in old days. Uh, so that, that that's this is something that uh, uh, I think describe a lot of uh, uh, this strategy that you observe that today. Um, let me come in to talk about uh, uh, something uh, economics uh, instead of the politics. Uh, China so far has uh, signed about ten uh, free trade agreements. Uh, the first, uh, the, 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 these uh, 10 countries, 10 locations is uh, Hong Kong, Macau, very obvious, they're part of China. Uh, Asia country, ASEAN. ASEAN is, is the backyard of China, so, you know, certainly. And Singapore, um, you know, pretty much a Chinese country, right? They, well, all the Chinese <laughs> there. Uh, <laughs> I keep that in mind. I'm not. I'm not representing Chinese government, so I can say whatever I want, right? So <laughs> <laughs> now these uh, people down there, they are, they are shaking their head. You know, this. I'm just joking, right? I'm just joking. Right? <laughs> Pakistan. Pakistan is all weather friends, right? So we have you know, our relation has go a long way, right? So uh, New Zealand, they have war. Right? They have war. You know, China is the largest uh, textile producing country, so you know, we need a war. Um, Costa Rica, you know, that puzzles a lot of people. You know, China signs a free trade agreement with post Costa Rica is so small. You know, why they bother this? And what do they have? Costa Rica. I mean, they have some they have some coal, but too expensive to ship to China. Um, they have tourism, right? I mean, they can go there for vacation. I'm not sure Chinese is ready to go there um, at this point. I think it's very political, uh, strategically important, and China signs. Uh, uh, established diplomatic relationship with Costa Rica this 2007, 2008, and um, this switched from Taiwan to, to, to China, so that's uh, important for, from that perspective. The other two, 
these are located in this area. I'm sorry, I need to put these things on. Um, what is this? this? Yes, in the Latin America. Uh, one is Chile, and the other one is Peru. So these are the two countries that China signs free trade agreement. In fact, the first free trade agreement China signed is, is with Chile. Now, uh, but if you look at this, uh, what they have, um, it's very obvious because Chile is the largest copper producer in the world. And Chile, the, every year, the annual copper production is about 15 million metric tons. And Chile produces one third of that. Right? And uh, uh, China is the largest copper consumer. China consumes one third of the copper production a year. And one third of Chinese copper consumption is imported. So it is very natural that China wants Chile, and Chile it can provide something Chinese, uh, China needs for the, uh, economic growth. Uh, Peru, Peru also is the Peru is the is the third or the second largest copper producer in the world. Depending on how, depend on the year, sometimes the United States is the second largest and sometimes Peru. So uh, China signed uh, a free trade agreement with Chile in um, uh, 2005, it got effective in 2006, and 2009 uh, signed free trade agreement with Peru. Uh, and then that has uh, uh, the relationship between uh, Chile and China uh, and Latin America gets very tight. And the reason here is that uh, China now has uh, uh, this uh, uh, futures exchange, the Shanghai Futures Exchange, which is the second largest uh, in terms of trading volume in copper, just next to the London Mercantile Exchange. China has already surpassed the New York uh, Mercantile Exchange in terms of the copper future exchange. And China is now contributing about uh, a quarter of the information flow to the copper market. So nowadays, well, so still, London is the, still the largest, the contributing uh, over 50% of the uh, information uh, to, to the world called copper market. So now, uh, the copper mine, uh, mine, uh, uh, mine companies uh, watch uh, Shanghai Futures Exchange very closely. Any, uh, uh, in, um, any um, disturbance, any uh, um, uh, shocks in, uh, in the Latin America, in Chile, will be reflected in the Shanghai Futures Exchange. Uh, so, and um, in terms of the trade between China and the Latin America country, copper is just one uh, example. But the trade between ch uh, China and the Latin America goes more than beyond, beyond the copper. Uh, uh, if you look at someone in, in earlier in the day talk about a comparative advantage between uh, 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 China and Latin America and the complementary of a trade. And if you look at this, they are really complement to each other. And Latin America country, they are resource rich. Uh, the commodities, they are, they, they are definitely the, the one that China uh, 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 needs. And also, if you look at this, this is China is on the northern hemisphere and Chile is in the southern hemisphere. The, the complementary of weather also indicates that there's a lot of complementary of trade. And if you look at this, there's a lot of agricultural products being exported from Chile and to China. And there's also lots of agricultural products exported from China to Chile. Uh, because when Chile is in the summer, they grow uh, apples and pears, and these things ship it to China when China is in the winter. And when China is in the uh, in the summer, China ships um, apples and to, to a supermarket in Chile, and so this complementary of the weather and facilitate lots of trading uh, between uh, uh, the, the, the two continents. And besides, uh, the, uh, uh, Chilean wine is very popular. Um, somehow, the California wine is not able to, to break uh, into the market in, in China, but Chilean wine has been uh, quite... Uh, um, um, Move on from Chile to other Latin American countries. Brazil is a very large uh, nation and certainly has a very close relationship with China. And a uh, uh, lot of commodities and uh, being exported to, to China. And uh, China is, uh, 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 well, uh, one example of something that you probably may not pay attention is that uh, Brazil uh, export uh, uh, 
uh, hundreds, hundreds of millions of chicken feet to China. Chicken feet. No? Right? The feet, yeah. So is the U.S. That's right. In the beginning, it's the mail in the U.S. in 1996. Uh, 1995, actually, somebody figured out that there's a huge market here. Some people come in here to, to, to chop off the chicken feed and ship it to China. And the market quickly grew to $6 million by the next year. By two, not the 2007, the market was $180 million US dollars just from the United States. Now, but something happened in the United States that uh, because of this avian flu scare and you know, some people uh, find out that the chickens in New Zealand, I'm uh, sorry, in, in uh, New Jersey somewhere and coughed a little bit uh, more than usual. Uh, so Chinese said, okay, you know, we don't want your chickens. So a lot of containers are circling around in the ocean. They left the Long Beach port or the New York port, but cannot get to, 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 to China. So they, they're floating around in the ocean for, for a long time. And the Brazil immediately figured out there's opportunity and Brazil jumped into the market and now Brazil uh, export uh, more chicken feet than the United States to, 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 to China. And Brazil, uh, uh, J, let me see, uh, JSB is, uh, maybe it's JSB, uh, is the largest uh, uh, poultry producer uh, in the world. Uh, they beat uh, Tyson. Right. Uh, so, I mean, so lots of those things has been, there's a lot of complementary uh, between the, the, the two countries. Uh, another, the third, uh, another, one more thing, uh, uh, two more things actually. There's one more thing that I want to talk about is current, someone talk about the currency, the internationalization of the Chinese currency. Uh, uh, so currently, there are about a dozen countries assigned the currency swap with China. Uh, meaning that the Chinese uh, central bank give the Chinese RMB to those countries as their foreign exchange reserve, and these countries give their own currency to, to China. And so then when they do trade, they simply forget about the dollar. Uh, we, don't, you know, we don't trust these dollars. You know, we don't know what happened to the dollars, so forget about dollars. Right? So now there are about the 12 countries. They, uh, they use uh, IMB as a denomination to do the trade. Uh, one of the countries is Argentina. And, and certainly as a reason behind this, there's a lot of trade between China and Argentina. And more than 80% of the soil being uh, export uh, from Argentina goes to China. So there's a huge amount of trade. Uh, and and the, so currency swap is one thing. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, China is negotiating with more countries. So there probably will be more currency swap with some Latin American country. Uh, Chile may be possible, uh, one example. Um, so. Uh, uh, back to the, internationalized, the internationalization of IMB, and uh, my guess is that probably it takes another 10 to 15 years. Uh, right now, the Chinese currency has been appreciating 3.5% uh, a year. With this, uh, and the pressure of uh, appreciation is still there and strong. And uh, the grand strategy of uh, President uh, um, uh, Pan uh, Yuan, uh, just, uh, I don't know if they put the Chinese name. <laughs> President Yuan just been talking about uh, the grand strategy of China try to ship, uh, shift from export oriented to domestic consumption. Well, in order to accomplish this strategy, one important thing is that the need to get the foreign currency, the value of the foreign currency uh, in a proper position, and meaning that the Chinese currency will have to appreciate uh, to, uh, at, the, at the, a steady uh, pace. So uh, with this uh, pace, if we continue these this things, and probably uh, my expectation is by uh, around uh, 20, uh, 10 years later, what is that, uh, uh, 2015, around that time, uh, probably uh, China, Chinese currency, what, uh, uh, that's probably the, the, time, the best time for Chinese government to allow the currency to, to free float. And that's uh, basically says that as about, there are about 10 to 15 years, a window of opportunity, Chinese, Government will have to get things ready to move uh, uh, currency to free float. Uh, one last thing I want to touch, I think my time is pretty much up. That uh, One last thing I want to talk about is uh, um, uh, foreign direct investment. Now, I want to uh, just quickly show you this. 
oh, this is a small. How do I do this? Yes. So this is the, the 2009 Chinese outbound foreign direct investment in the dollar terms. If you look at these, you see that it's a very interesting. You see none of the Latin American countries shows up in this, in this, in this table. Uh, in fact, if you look at this, the majority of the foreign direct investments goes to the Asia country, about uh, th uh, three quarters of the foreign direct investment outside from China go outside goes to um, it. Certainly you can claim that some of the money goes to Hong Kong, be rerouted to Latin America, and, uh, do, and there's, there's no way that we can verify this. There's a, certainly it is a possibility here. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the foreign trade seems that uh, it's, it's, there is still a, a, a long way to go for China to fully take advantage of uh, the, the, the rich resources in, uh, in a Latin American country. If you, but if you look at this, what kind of country, uh, companies that are going to do, uh, is doing the over, uh, outbound foreign direct investment from China, most of these, country, most of these companies are, are uh, state-owned enterprises. And these state-owned enterprises, these are the central government-owned state-owned enterprises. These are the, the companies that directly reported to the SASAC, um, report to the state council. Um, uh, the private enterprises, private companies, they may be interested. They are reaching to the to the stage that are possibly they are looking in out to out, uh, out investment out, uh, outbound investment. But uh, uh, the that the knowledge um, they're not familiar with the the knowledge is is lacking and they didn't, don't know how to deal with the uh, the, the the market. So culturally, it's also difficult, and Latin America is far, far away. Uh, logistics is very difficult. So that for a, a, a private company, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult at this point. Uh, there's another group of companies that you can see that is, uh, is the local government controlled uh, company. And we find that, in one part of some of my research, we find that uh, uh, mo uh, majority of the uh, of the uh, merger acquisition in China, they are very regional. Uh, usually within the city, within the provinces, and these companies tend to be uh, very much local government-owned, state-owned company. So, uh, the, because the incentive is that for the local government is that they want to promote a local GDP, a local hiring. So uh, these companies tend to less likely to go investment uh, to do an overseas uh, investment. Uh, outbound uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, one last point of FDI is that the political risk. And China still do not know how to deal with the political risk. And, um, um, and hasn't been uh, experienced uh, this in the past. And the recent episode in Africa, in Libya, has indicated that the political risk uh, can have a tremendous impact on the foreign direct investment for the, uh, of the country's uh, uh, well-being, and which in the past, and China always relied on the, the past friendship, right? the past friendship. And, uh, and somehow, I think this old mentality, the Chinese the mentality that is called non-interference, and do not consider the, the regime change, do not consider the, uh, the, uh, the political structure, this old mentality has to change. And because if you simply say, we are coming here just for making money, we don't care what you do, and this strategy can be very risky down the road. So to the Chinese own interest, China has to reevaluate the old uh, way of doing business and has to emphasize the risk uh, uh, management, particularly when they moved also moved to, to Latin America. Well, thank you very much.